Uh, hi, thank you, East Bay Leadership Council. I'm Dale Roberts. I'm principal engineer with uh, Sonoma, Sonoma County Water Agency. We go by our nickname, which is Sonoma Water. Um, we are the project manager of this advanced quantitative precipitation information project, which is a uh, uh, almost $20 million grant from the Department of Water Resources to deploy some local radars to allow us to get a better um, uh, a better look, more of nearsighted vision of, with uh, uh, localized radars of uh, the precipitation uh, coming into the Bay Area um, but via those atmospheric rivers that Gary was talking about. It gives us a closer look at the atmospheric rivers behave. Uh, behavior as it hits our undulating localized uh, 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 terrain in the Bay Area, rather than relying on uh, larger radars with a uh, broader field of vision, but designed for the plains. Um, the project we expect to be done uh, completely built out by the end of next calendar year, 2025. We're working on extension with DWR. And at that time, we're gonna hand it over to uh, uh, John Rutz's group, which is UC San Diego's Scripps Institute of Oceanography Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, uh, CW3E, you can see on the title slide there. Um, they'll be taking over the whole system, um, but we also have with us Mark Boucher, who's a senior hydrologist with Contra Costa County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. Uh, Mark's been an active participant in the early deployment of some of the radars and how to use uh, the data that the system is, the early data the system is getting uh, uh, as a uh, uh, practitioner uh, on that front and how to use it. So they've got some great information for you. Thank you all for having us. And I will turn it over to John. And just a note, is that picture, Dale, that, that picture is the East Bay radar, correct? That is, uh, yes, that is an X-band radar at... Uh, Rocky Ridge, which is a peak in Las Trumpas Regional Park, is kind of at the end of Bollinger Canyon Road for, for some of you locals. Uh, and that's looking roughly to the southwest mm -hmm. direction. Um, and uh, it's been in operation about a year and we'll, we'll hear some more about some of the data it's collecting. Thanks, Dale. Yeah, thank you, Dale. So thanks for the nice introduction and, and thank you, Meg and others for, who have helped organize this. My name is John Rutz. As Dale said, I'm from uh, CW3E and, and NOAA and the National Weather Service previously. And as everyone knows, NOAA stands for the National Organization for the Advancement of Acronyms. So I'll try to keep it at a minimum today, but um, any acronyms that are in there, I'll, I'll try to make sure I explain really well because we do tend to throw a lot of them around. I'm a meteorologist by training. I've been program manager for AQPI at the center for about a year and a half now. Um, this is just a slide showing the, a myriad of agencies that are partners and supporters in some way to the program. There are even others beyond this. These are some of the bigger ones, just, just to highlight that this is a very sort of big tent multi-project partnership. So what is the AQPI system? It's really, it's a rainfall observation and forecast system developed specifically for the greater San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm going to talk on the next few slides why it's specific to the Bay Area. But really, we provide it provides enhanced radar observations and a number of other products, uh, forecast tools, and a decision support framework for partners in the area. As Dale mentioned, it did begin with a $20 million grant from California Department of Water Resources. This was back in 2016. The local partner agency uh, committee, or the LPAC, there's one acronym as we call it, they provide a lot of support and advocacy for AQPI. So we're very, very thankful to them for everything that they do. And the administration of this program, as Dale also mentioned, is going to be passing from Sonoma Water to CW3E over the next year or so. In terms of the size of the program, right now our ongoing uh, funding is about $1.9 million a year. One million of that is from the state through DWR, and the other 0.9 comes uh, from federal sources. So both of these investments allow us to operate, maintain the system, and leverage the existing grant. When the grant expires, um, and it will expire, we're currently in the process of pursuing this no-cost extension for radar installs. When it expires, there will be a little bit of uh, a gap in terms of operation and maintenance of the system. 
So why is it needed? In short, uh, when heavy rain impacts the Bay Area, decision makers need accurate weather information to act. And so this radar system complements the existing network by addressing some of the, let's say, limitations within that system. And they're limitations because the existing network was really designed for severe weather over the plains. It's designed to look high into supercell thunderstorms and identify hail and identify tornadic signatures and big rain formation that's occurring very high in the atmosphere. In the Bay Area, when atmospheric rivers hit, oftentimes the heaviest precipitation is being generated at 5,000 feet or so. So a lot of those traditional radar beams look right over the heaviest precipitation. Similarly, if you look at this little bright side of the schematic, sometimes the radar is actually blocked by the hills and the variable topography of the Bay Area. So you don't get as good of a view of the storm as you'd like to. So what AQPI does is strategically place these X-band radars, which we're gonna talk about on the next slide and a C-band radar as well, uh, strategically place these in, in sort of locations where they can really get an accurate picture of what rainfall is falling, particularly in those densely populated, more urban areas, a much better view than traditional radar. So I'm gonna talk about three types of radar here and I'm not gonna get like really into the weeds, but I wanna highlight the differences because it's important to understand why AQPI is needed. This is the S-band or NEXRAD radar. This is the traditional weather service radar. It's what you see if you pull up some kind of radar app on your phone. As you can see, it's very large. It's like five to six stories tall, um, and it can see a very long way. But the level of detail that it provides is, I'd say, kind of on the lower end. It takes seven minutes to update, which is kind of a long time when heavy rain is occurring, and it's very, very expensive. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got the X-band radar. This doesn't see as far, maybe about 40, 50 kilometers in each direction, but it does see within that area at a very, very high level of detail, much higher than the S-band. The cost is also very low. It's coming up on a million dollars now with inflation, but previously it's been less than that. And so these can be installed relatively easily compared to the big guys over there on the left. This is the, the backbone of the AQPI system currently. Coming in next year, as well as going to be the C-band radar, and this is just kind of the middle ground between those other two. It's going to sort of integrate the network, provide some redundancy. We'll look at a map later. But the key thing to know is that this is kind of the middle ground in terms of range and level of detail. Here's the map that I promised. So this is what the AQPI system is going to look like when it's complete. Um, many of these are already uh, up and running and operational. The X-Band at Sonoma Water, Rocky Ridge, Santa Clara. Santa Cruz, which is actually like not technically part of AQPI, it was funded through a different method, but they're, they're sort of part of the family here. It's an X-band in the Bay Area. And then we still need to install the X-band here on the peninsula and the C-band will go here in Marin County next year. And again, all of this is to sort of, the, the C-band when that goes in, it's gonna do two things for us. It's gonna provide redundancy uh, throughout a big chunk of the system here. It's also going to allow us to see further offshore and give us more lead time as these strong storms and some of the more intense rain bands approach the coast. So what does this look like? What, what does the AQPI radar do for you? Here's an example. Uh, this is down in the Santa Cruz area last winter. Uh, not, not this past winter, the one before that. So this is actually March of 2023. And there was a really interesting storm that made landfall actually. I had sort of a almost an eye to it, almost like a hurricane, just Northwest of Santa Cruz. And I've got the sort of traditional radar over here on the right, the AQPI on the left, and you can see the difference in the level of detail and clarity that's there. And this really matters when you're looking to identify heavy rainfall and flash flooding and issue evacuation orders. Not only is there more detail uh, spatially, but if you notice the image on the left updates twice as frequently. So it updates much more rapidly because these aren't, aren't doing as many scans, they aren't doing as many elevations. So the X-band is able to give you like every two minutes a new picture of the atmosphere, what's happening. And so this was a case with, you know, many, many heavy rain, strong winds, down trees, all sorts of damage associated with this event. This is another one that um, I don't have any impacts documented for this one. I wanted to show a, a picture from the Rocky Ridge radar as well, because I know this is the East Bay Leadership Council. I think the reason there weren't impacts with this is just that this was a very fast moving uh, rain band. So it, it moved over these areas very quickly. But you can see as this loads through again, this thing sort of developing from the south and coming right up through here, um, through Pleasanton, Dublin, that area. And again, the difference between the X-band on the left, the next route on the right is really 
quite striking um, in terms of the update frequency and the level of detail. We can take, we can kind of zoom in. This is, you know, getting a little bit nerdy into the weeds, but I'm a, I'm a scientist. I'm a meteorologist by training. I got to do it. Now we're not looking at the reflectivity. We're looking at the rain rate. So this is the same snapshot from a storm making landfall in Santa Cruz. And the thing, if, if, you know, the geographic orientation and the colors are a little weird. Okay. The thing I want to highlight is that within this rain band making landfall on the traditional radar, you got about 0.2 inches per hour. If you go to the geohazards, folks, 0.2 inches per hour, if you've got a, a fire area, burn area, that maybe is a landslide, is a post-fire debris flow. It depends on the characteristics of the soil and all sorts of other things. Using the AQPI radar, there's an area of rain rates pushing one and a half inches per hour in that band. That is a post-fire debris flow at almost every time, almost every time. And I don't think it's really that much of an exaggeration to say that this has potentially life-saving significance. And we don't have a documented case yet of the, this sort of situation where one of these bands went right over a, a burn scar and we could look at it both ways. But in the next few years, it's it, it's going to happen. It's probably going to happen. And the, the potential for this left one to really uh, save lives and property is, is notable. Stakeholder feedback. I don't want to spend, um, I included this, I assume these slides are going to be distributed after, and I'm not going to read all this text because there's a lot, but I do want to just highlight that a variety of stakeholders, whether, uh, you know, Mike Anderson, the California state climatologist at DWR, some of you probably know him, Emily Zedler, engineer at Valley Water, uh, Mark Strudley, who's now the executive director of Pajaro Regional Man Flood Management Agency. A lot of folks in different geographic areas, different specific lines of work have said positive things about AQPI, about the potential of the program going forward, about the ability to see with greater detail and greater clarity when and where these storms are impacting certain areas and how much rain is falling. And frankly, just redundancy. Again, during that 2022-2023 winter, the weather service radar went down for about a week and they were really relying quite heavily on the local AQPI radars to fill in those gaps and help with their assessments. Also a part of the system is uh, this thing developed by the US uh, GS, Cosmos, or the Coastal Storm Modeling System, takes into, a variety of, takes into account a variety of atmospheric and oceanic inputs to essentially produce a water level forecast. So for some of the agencies in the Bay Area that are concerned with coastal inundation, of course, there's concerns related to climate change, both what that's just doing to sea level and also what that's doing to raise the intensity of storms. This is a really valuable tool for getting a handle on what the water level is likely to be under different situations, different forecast situations in the Bay Area. And this is one of the tools in the toolbox, if you will, for AQPI. You know, we, we talk a lot about the radars. It's more than just radars. It's this whole sea to sky observation platform. We also have uh, what's called a radar nowcast. We partner strongly with collaborators at Colorado State. There's an institute there that is world renowned for their expertise in radar installation, radar technology, radar derived products, of which this is one. So what you're actually seeing here is observed radar on the left, and on the right is what we call a nowcast, and it's updating every like six minutes or so. So it's taking the latest radar observation and then updating the nowcast. And then it doesn't really show it on this slide, but that nowcast can run out to an hour. It only runs out about six minutes here and then it updates. So it's not ideal. I would have, I need to get a version from them that shows the whole hour. But this can give you a really good sense of what's going to happen in the very, very short term, one hour time frame. If someone's concerned with where do I put staff, where do I direct resources, this product is going to be able to help with that. So I've talked about a lot of different things, radars, um, forecast tools um, are part of this as well, different, you know, Nowcast, Cosmos, where does it all go? How do you integrate all this? Well, AQPI has a user interface, but frankly, it doesn't serve the needs of the stakeholders, the current one that exists. It has some use, but we can do much better. And over the last six to nine months or so, we've been building this new framework for doing this. We've been developing it at, at the center. And what we're kind of developing around is this concept where you've got a dynamic map on the left. You can zoom in and out. You can pan around the map. Um, you can pull up. You can click on points or watersheds and pull up forecast data like is being shown in this example on the right. The current interface doesn't really let you do any of this. It lets you see some static images. And you can download some forecast model data, which is useful, but 
but we can do better. So we're really pushing the development of this website, not only from a data display perspective, but also a data delivery as well. We're ultimately gonna push forecast data, push radar data to some of the stakeholders that want to integrate that data into their systems as well. This is just another zoomed in view now showing kind of the San Jose Valley area, Santa Clara, and all those orange dots are rain gauges, blue dots are locations for our in-house forecast model. I don't have time to go into all the details of this, but I just want to highlight that we are really integrating a lot of observation sources, a lot of forecasts into one place to try to make it really easy for our partners to get a handle on what's happening right now, next seven days. Additional major efforts, um, I'll move through this pretty quickly. I'll just say there's a lot of research going on in terms of how this extra high resolution radar data can be used to improve short range forecast models. Uh, with NOAA, this is gonna be getting going over the next year or so. We're also working very hard to begin documenting the benefit of AQPI uh, along two tracks, both sort of anecdotally through case studies. These really kind of speak to like the personal stories of homes and, and lives affected by, by this data. And also more statistically to try to quantify what the economic benefit of this better observation and forecast system to the Bay Area is. NOAA uh, a few years ago estimated about $61 million a year in avoided costs. And now that the system is approaching full deployment, we think we can probably um, turn the screws and get like a harder analysis and some, some higher numbers with greater fidelity to them. So that concludes my portion of the presentation. For now, I'll come back for the final slide, but I'm gonna hand it over now to Mark Boucher for a little bit more of a hands-on how, how you use this data. And Mark, just tell me when you want me to advance slides. Yeah, I'll just say, okay, how's that? Sure. So this is a kind of an overview slide from my start. So, okay, John. So the, the first image is the current interface. So if I today wanted to go in and choose a different place, a different spot, point, grid, whatever, for a, a, a forecast, to get a forecast at a point, you see those points in the map, those are places where I can get forecast. I'd have to go into this interface, move a point or add a point. And what's, what's really great about this and the future interface, I'm sure, as it gets updated, is that I can choose where I want the data. I'm not beholden to um, something that I have no control on, so, okay. <clears throat> This is an image of our rain map. So if you were to go to this, these uh, URLs, um, one of them is directly to it. The other one's a redirect from our county. You would see what I call, what we call a rain map. And it is just shows you where our rain gauges are. You can actually turn on some radar. It's not the AQPI radar. It's the uh, NextRad radar, but you could kind of see this as an overall view of what's going on. You can look at different rain amounts for different durations. Next, uh, okay. And then what we do, and this is what we talked about mostly, is we grab that forecast and we grab our rainfall and we put them together and currently kind of show them in this thing, what I call the AQPI forecast table. So it, it's showing the AQPI forecast and what it's looking like in the next 24 hours and more. But it's also, there's an, in, part of it that is off of our own data. So, okay. Ah, there's a link. So if you go to the rain map, oh, links, it's okay. Just, you can go back one, sorry, John. Sorry. Yeah, those, those uh, links on the rain map are links to my forecast table. So it's, once you go to the rain map, the idea is you go there and you find all the other information. Okay. So, Antecedent conditions, that's a big word. I kind of shy away from it a little bit, but at the bottom there's the definition. There are conditions that exist prior to an event. So in our case, we're talking about rainfall. This is a map of Civic Park. I was out there one time and it had been raining and you see these puddles. And imagine if the this field, this park, was already saturated. If it started to rain harder, that rain wouldn't soak in. It would it would run right off. It's not like concrete, but still it would, it would, most of the rain would run off, even though there is still some soaking into the ground. 
as we're looking at that picture. So the, the takeaway is that it's more likely to flood when the watershed is saturated. So we have these conditions that can exist prior to flooding. So go ahead, John. So seven, five, three. Um, these are the numbers we use. And, and uh, a previous employee went through this and I took some actual data from times when it did flood and I've confirmed this. This is actually very good. So when you have seven inches of rain since July, uh, five inches of rain in the last 30 days, three inches of rain in the last seven days, we we're basically primed for flooding. So when these conditions are met or nearly met, we're primed for flooding, which means hey, we need to really be looking at the forecast because we're saturated and a big storm could cause flooding, okay? And so what is that forecast? Well, the after looking at several storms, two inches of rain in 24 hours, when the watersheds were already saturated with the 753 conditions, we're likely to flood. And I, have, I don't show a plot here, but I had plots where we showed the it shows the rainfalls, it accumulates and kind of becomes colored when this the seven, five, and three conditions are met. And <clears throat> then I use the rainfall amount to look at the future. I say, oh, it looks in the future, there's going to be uh, two inches in the next 24 hours. And sure enough, 24 hours later was the time that the storm actually it actually caused flooding somewhere in our county. So these these um, these conditions are real, and we do keep an eye on them. John, go ahead. So here's here's kind of the overview, 7532, year, month, weekday. It's not too hard to, to remember this and get this set, even though sometimes I'm thinking, is it five months? No, it's five inches in a month, three inches in a week, two in a day. Next. So we had a student worker work on graphics and they came up with this logo. And this is a logo that if you see this, you can click it, it probably goes to a link to a page that explains what 7532 is, okay? So the 753 comes from our rainfall data and it's the antecedent conditions, hey John. And the two inch comes from AQPI forecast data. And the forecast data currently comes from this high resolution rapid refresh uh, model that goes out about 18, uh, 18 hours or so. And then there's a second model that goes out about five days. And so this is where we look at, so not just looking the next 24 hours, right? We actually can look out five days. The, res the forecast gets better and better the closer the storm gets, but we're actually able to not just look at the next 24 hours, we can look way out. John, so we currently look at the forecast at these five points. And the, the reason for choosing these five points is to get some kind of distribution around the county, put these points in places that aren't necessarily really high in elevation because we're looking for something that would represent kind of the, the, the middle range in elevations because elevation does have an effect on rainfall amounts. Um, and partly because it's, the complexity, if I had that many more points, what I'm currently doing is bringing the data into a spreadsheet, doing some manipulation and trying to display it. And if you started looking at 10 points, just multiplies the effort uh, in the future. And he actually really recently trying to use some programming to do a lot of the processing and then bring it into a spreadsheet or maybe even better, uh, get some programmers to actually put it in a website where some of that background calculations go very fast and maybe someday we'll have a, a more dynamic uh, way of looking at this, but currently this is where we're at, okay? So this is a, a look at my rain gauges. There's 45 stations, 32 of those have rain gauges. We collect the data every 15 minutes, and then <clears throat> we use these gauges to track the antecedent conditions near the five points. So none of these gauges are actually on them one of those five points, but we use the surrounding gauges to kind of get an idea of what's going on. Next. So this is our rain map. And down at the lower corner, I think I already mentioned, there's links. Next. And these are the two links. I already highlighted them in the previous image, but 
this is what, if you were go to the rain map, you could see this forecast table. You could pull it up on your phone. And that's part of my goal is whatever we do, it works on a mobile device. So some parts of the, if you look at on a computer, it might look a little clunky, but part of it so that when you do look it on your phone, you can see these things. Right now, the forecast table is pretty boring. There's no forecast radar uh, rainfall. But if you want to see the QPI radar viewer, that link is there too. So that what, what John was talking about, it's available right there. You don't have to go back to this PowerPoint. You could just go right there, okay? So this is what the forecast table looks like during some storm. And this is, uh, looks like December, 2022. At the very top, there's little boxes. And when the seven, five and three are at the top of each column, each column represents one of those points. And the seven, five, three highlights when those conditions are met. And then the cells are changed color uh, as the, the rainfall rate gets to and it starts exceeding two inches in 24 hours. So again, the first model is 73 15 minute time steps. And the second model is 119 one hour time steps. The next that pan, you know calculates out to 18 and a quarter hours or just about nine days total. So when this table uses the short-term forecast first and when that ends, then it picks up and starts showing the long-term forecast. Next, okay. And I talked about they're highlighted, the cells are highlighted, different conditions. So two inches in 24 hours is 0 0.083 inches per hour. And then again, the it's highlighted red when you, at that point, you look forward in the calculations and you see more than two inches in 24 hours. Let's go to the next slide. It's kind of an example of a series of these forecast tables during a storm. This was December 30th, 22 and 22. You see the noon line. I tried to line up the images so that it was the same time. <coughs> the first three are just an hour apart. The next one's uh, two hours. But you can see in the first slide at 5.51 a.m., I say, if you get up in the morning, you look at the rain map, you knew rain was coming and the National Weather Service is doing its job. You say, oh, hey, there's a red square there. That's a... Uh, there's two inches in 24 hours at that point. You look at the top, you see the little green, yellow, and red squares are filled in that center column. Say, oh, we're, wow, we have one 15 minute time frame when it looks 24 hours ahead and it sees more than two inches in, or two inches or more in 24 hours. So then the next hour, you look, it gets updated every hour. Next hour or so, you look at it and say, oh, wow, it's not, this is uh, in the south central point. And wow, that's, uh, that shows a longer period where the two inches and the 24 hours will be met. And again, it's looking beyond. So it's, it's looking from that point, 24 hours in the future. And you go to the next hour and now you see even more red is showing. It just shows as the storm is getting closer, the forecast gets better and better. Things change, you know, in, even in an hour, that atmospheric river can kind of move in a different way and the forecast pick it up. And then at nine o'clock, in the morning, you see I've got a lot of red that tells me that I need to be paying attention to this storm. Next. So this is uh, eight, so 12 hours later about, and you see the storm is on us. Now you look at the very top, if you see a T in the cell, it just means a trace of rain, which is like less than a hundredth of an inch of rain. And as you look forward, you see the, the red is there. And then it, the red goes away, but there's orange. And that means the rain rate is still at the same rate or greater than two inches in 24 hours. And this is, you know, we have to be ready. And so what happens for me is when these tables, this table starts showing these colors, I'll keep a look at it. I, I can look further. I mean, this is just the top half of that table. And you can look further and see the timing of the rainfall. And I will, if I think it's significant, I'll, inform my supervisor, my boss, my manager. And uh, then it, it goes up, you know, he thinks it's enough. And actually, I sent out the email to several people, maintenance. I send it out to, again, my boss and his boss. And then at some point, it gets significant like this, they make the decision to inform the emergency operations center. Now, at that point, the National Weather Service has probably already alerted people, hey, we could we have intense rain is coming, but because it's 7532, we can say, hey, this is 
highly likely that there'd be some flooding someplace. And so this is what, this is how we use it. So John's been telling about the science and the radars and the really cool stuff. This, yeah, when he gets down to it, what's, what am I going to do? What, what decision am I going to make? Um, and this is where we have been using this data for the East Bay for Contra Costa County. Okay, John. <clears throat> again, at the top, there's a legend and it's a lot of detail here. But again, when it's red, there's two inches in 24 hours. I actually put in a kind of a light red <laughs> or pink. So it's 0.8 inches in, in the next 24 hours. And it just kind of gives you a sense, hey, it is pretty intense. It's a little more than just a heavy rain, but there's something happening in within a 24 hour period from this cell. Uh, and there's some other things there. There is actually a flash flood warning. I've never seen it pop up, but if we have a certain amount of rain in a shorter term, that we could have flash flood. So that is there, but I've never seen it pop up yet. So we continue to modify this, expand it as needed. I, I, I You see there's a version number underneath my logo. That version number will change once in a while when I think something needs to be fixed or updated. And so as you go on it, you might see it looks a little different. That's because we actively, I actively work on this as a new condition happens. Like, well, we didn't, uh, this doesn't address that situation and I make changes. Next. Down at the bottom, there's the map that shows you the five points. And on the map, it actually shows, you know, when you get two inches, 24 hours, a little red box will pop up. And actually the number turned, the, the box turned red. And then the, on the right, there's this, they call, my old boss called it the floodometer. It's kind of like if you go to the mountains and you see the fire danger, that's what this is for. It's kind of like, well, the rain, what's the rain danger level today? And as we go through the storm, you can see in this case, the seven was met, the five was met, three was met, and we we're pushing the two inch. And if, when it's, when that purple part of it goes all the way to the bottom, you know that two inches is met and uh, we're in the 7532 conditions. There have been a couple times when everything's met and the purple slice moves down below the horizontal and you know, okay, we're, we're there. Um, next. Go down below that, there's actually some graphs that gives you a timing of the storm. The top one is intensity. And because intensity knows no time step, you can take the, the amount of rain divided by the time step and you have an intensity. If you just did amount of rainfall, so the amount of rainfall that falls within an hour could be quite a bit compared to how much falls within a 15 minutes time step. So that's why that is an intensity. The middle one is, is that red line is, shows the two inch 24 hour forecast. So it's a kind of a rolling forecast and so, if it were two inches in 24 hours, that, that line, the, the, the lines below the, <laughs> the blue lines or different colors there, they would go above the red and we say, oh yeah, we've got two inches in 24 hours and that. And the last one's just cumulative rainfall. How much is gonna be raining? Um, and then there's a, you see the vertical blue line is kind of the difference between the, the point where it changes from a quarter hour time step to a one hour time steps. And if the, you wanna see the data, there's links at the bottom, you just go and you can look at the data yourself. There's the links down below. I think there's some some of the labels. I, as I was putting this together, I realized some things were inaccurate. I need to look at that and um, make some updates. And I will. Next, I think I turn it back to John to do some summary. John, could I ask Mark a question? Yes, Anne. Um, Mark, for the sake of the non-technical people here like me, yes. um, do you have an example? I know you've talked about it before. Some of the actual situations, an example of the situations you go through. I remember you telling us about like a creek washout that washed out a road. Um, you know, I'm kind of I'm understanding your your um, models and how your your um, uh, trying to figure out what's going to happen when. But could you give an example of how AQPI might have worked for you in one of those kind of catastrophic flood examples? I think that would help ground what, what you're talking about here, at least for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. at the time, I we did have a Alhambra Valley Road washout. You may, re may remember that. 
there was a culvert there that had had a history of having problems uh, in that story to try to make it brief. The maintenance guys were out there dealing with the slides of the, the dirt from the road embankment slides off and gets on the road. So they were basically cleaning up the road. It's a road crew. And they got to this culvert and, and they, uh, well, I guess the supervisor moved ahead of them, kind of seeing what else have they need to work on and whether there's something more important to work on and kind of bring some crews up. And, um, uh, about that time, a woman was going, I guess, northbound, or I guess it's eastbound. She was going eastbound. She crossed over the, the culvert, kind of like a bridge, but it's a culvert instead of a bridge. And she had gone a ways, and she realized she had forgotten something, and she turned around, and she's coming back. And on the way back, the supervisor was standing near that, and he started hearing noises and uh, couldn't see much because it was dark and rainy. And that culvert washed out and this he was able to put a barricade and this woman came back had just left home crosses we'd come back and there were barricades up and and very just very for there's no aqpi forecast involved but she's really fortunate because in the dark rainy you know just driving a very well-known road to her she probably could have just driven right off and probably lost her life but that whole culvert washed downstream that the, it was out and then now it's replaced by a bridge actually some fish passage elements made it easier to get the permits. Uh, but we did do a case study on that and they were trying to figure out you know, if we had a QPI and this was a point in uh, the models, what what could have happened? How could have a QPI worked? And there was, it, they found that it could, could have had, uh, could have been some earlier warnings that this culvert, not that it would wash out, but it would, that it would have high flow. So there's things that I envision AQPI working from. So right now we're just using the forecasts that exist. Uh, once the radars start playing into the forecast more, that's going to give us better definition than now cast that John talked about. And then I have the visions of taking these forecasts and putting them into hydro hydrology models that we could look at different points, key points like that crossing, uh, points where our where flooding could happen, like downtown Martinez can flood and actually trying to produce a forecast model that goes to flow so we can say, look, this storm right now in the forecast, it looks like it would exceed some capacity of these creeks or channels. And so, uh, so there is some practical, um, practical use of this in the future. It just takes time to understand the data, uh, how to get it into a model to run. And this is happening Senate uh, Santa Clara Valley Water District, I believe, is using these forecasts a little more. They're a little ahead of me in actually transferring the data from a forecast into a rainfall runoff and then a flow model for their system. So they have a few more staff than I have. Uh, that's part of it. So is that what you're talking about, Ann? Thanks, Mark. Yeah. And maybe others will have questions after John does the summary. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thanks, Mark. I'll, I'll go through this pretty quick. So AQPI is a federal, state, and local partnership that's driven by stakeholder needs. I think that's really important. We're, we're really not just some ivory tower trying to crank something out there and hope people use it. it. We really, we have users group meetings quarterly, and I'm listening to hear what people say. Um, Contra Costa County is one example I'd say Mark is, you know, he's the, the original power user of the AQPI data with his uh, using it to help drive the 7532 flood system and protocol that he's got going there. So that's that's a real sort of exemplar of how how the forecast data associated with AQPI can be used. Uh, we are building this new user interface with more robust decision support via both data display and delivery. I think that as this continues to roll out beginning like really this fall and through next winter, I think folks are really gonna be impressed with what that offers. And now here, my brief sales pitch is just that more funding will be needed soon for the system. Our, our current O&M cost is about 2.3 million and our current funding is about 1.9. This is workable right now because we're still leveraging the original $20 million grant from California Department of Water Resources. And that pays for a lot of the radar O&M, frankly. Um, but once that process of installing the last couple radars is finalized, we'll have to fill that gap. 
Um, the number that I like to put out for sort of a fully leveraged AQPI investment is 3.2 million a year. And if we got to this point, this would allow for, I think, the innovation and development that, that really can and should take place with the investment that's already been made in these tremendous instruments. We can do more advanced weather and hydro modeling as well that would really serve the needs of our partners. So with that, I will wrap it up. There's contact information uh, for all of the speakers in the upper right. There's some information and data access links in the bottom right as well. So thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, John and, and Mark, um, for a great presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Anne for questions. So if you have questions, uh, please uh, figure out how to raise your hand <laughs> on the, the Zoom. I'm not sure how to do that myself. Uh, so since I've got the mic for just a second, uh, Mark, um, I am imagining that with this, this much more accurate information that from a maintenance standpoint, you know, you're predicting uh, a big amount of water coming at, at the county. Does, does maintenance have a computerized inventory of storm drains with conditions um, associated with them so that a, a, a printout or, you know, some, something would show up as like, okay, these, these 10, uh, um, under drains need to be cleared or, you know, it, it's important that they be tended to before the rainfall hits. Is that, is that something you have in place or you could get in place? And, and, and actually, I'm thinking a little bit of artificial intelligence might help uh, in that predictive uh, situation. Great question. I know our maintenance guys, they know the system. And when storms come, there's certain culverts and bridges that have, have uh, capacity issues and a lot of it has to do with the debris up in the watershed that might flush down especially some of the earlier big storms uh, when that debris has been sitting there all summer just waiting to be washed down but I don't think we have something like you're saying where we know the capacity and a certain level of storm would say, oh, we need to get out there and make sure we fix these. I know they go out preseason. They've got they go routinely. They check, especially the, the places that are critical, and they do do they do do diligence like that. I think what you're what I would love to do with be to figure out a way to get these forecasts into a model, show that it works, show that it's easy, and then get the staff to be able to um, set up forecast points basically and then basically your model can run multiple multiple locations at the same time download the data convert it to the right format to suck it into a model run the model and say okay this hour what what points are critical and then go through and make sure we understand the capacity like you're saying of these points so i think there is there's a lot to do and i think what we when aqpi started i was involved in some of the early you know talks about even before we got the funding from from the state and the idea was that you know once this data becomes available people will find out ways to use it mm -hmm. and even though it's public agencies right now there's going to be a point where the data is somewhat publicly available and some uh, silicon valley whiz kid could grab it and create an app that pulls it in and use it, it does way more than we could, because that's what they do every day, and and maybe they sell the app for ninety nine cents, and they become the next uh, millionaire. But it'd be great if that could happen. That innovation, kind of a cloud source type innovation, could happen. Um, yeah. So you you build, pull it up, and you know if you need to take your your <clears throat> your umbrella as you go out to the car to to grab the groceries, that type of thing. I don't know. That's that's kind of far-fetched but yeah this data could be very useful in many ways uh, that people in our industry john and my industry don't even imagine so i think that's that's one of those things we're hoping that will happen through this good thanks Chris, i think you have a question yes i think for john i believe it so it's uh data driven so what, where are the servers located that's quenching all this and are they expandable so that you can take on data from, I'm sure there's some amateur, you know, 
meteorologists out there have their own radar at their houses. <laughs> so is it expandable to where you can take public data? Currently, I would say no. So the way that this has worked, so Colorado State is where all of the radar data is transmitted from the radars. It goes to Colorado State. They have a set of servers that they inherited from NOAA. And these servers are, are sort of tied to the existing user interface. And the existing user interface, part of the reason we're completely building it from scratch is that it's a black box of pre-compiled code. So uh, that's a sort of technical way of saying you, you can't modify it. You can't make the changes you wanna make. So it is kind of the existing system that it is. You can rebuild from scratch. Now we did at the center here in San Diego, we did just buy a brand new server for AQPI, a much more sort of high powered system than, than it's currently using for the, that other user interface. So the horsepower is there. The, the challenge I suppose would be, you know, working within the university IT security framework to allow for, I, I imagine it's not a very simple process to allow for anybody's radar data to come in. Now, once you crack that nut, so to speak, Presumably, it you know there, there's not a tech. I don't think the challenge is technical. I think it's more of an IT and security type of question. Um, I, did that sort of get towards answering your your question, Chris? Yeah, yeah. And I will just say part of one of the funny things is so right now the data flows to Colorado State because they installed all the radars. Then it flows to us at Scripps. We've talked about you know at some point did we just get the data? At scripts from the radars directly, but it, it is a lot of the water agencies, you know, Colorado State has told us, you know, just be prepared for, it takes a couple months to get through the necessary firewalls to set up those data feeds and that sort of thing. So it's a longer term uh, thing that we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Bob, you had your hand up? Uh, yes, a couple questions and then a comment. Um, so Mark, fascinating job you've got and but the dy dynamics of those red bars is is not it happens when it happens and not during a work day so who's watching that at midnight are you up on every night watching that those red bars appear and acting so or is it is it that dependent um so that's number one Number two is it strikes me that what what is the connection then to the news broadcasting industry in the Bay Area? Every TV channel has their weather forecaster. Uh, and um, how is that information provided? And then after you answer those questions, I have a, another comment to make. Good questions, Bob. In terms of the nighttime, you know, the, the table that you saw on my screen is only goes out so far, but the forecast goes out five days. So, Bob, if there was a storm that five days down raised its ugly head and we said, wow, this is this is significant. And it, it tells us what time of day the forecast when it's, when it's coming. So I imagine that if the storm uh was that intense and as it kept coming it maybe got more intense or something you know I've, my experience is sometimes they come in pretty intense and they kind of die off but if it was more intense that we have the emergency operations center across the street from me and i'm giving them their this kind of information is available to them uh, and and I, every year I, I kind of give them before the flood season, we have conversations about what this means. And I think that I could be, let's say it's Friday, Friday afternoon, we've got a storm that's coming in, it's going to hit Saturday night. So Friday afternoon, I would probably, mm -hmm. even if I'm home, I have Fridays off every other Friday, I would have my, my laptop at home looking at this and sending out an email to say, we've got, the storm is still, has still, it's still there, still coming could be midnight Saturday and the EOC is open 24 seven during those emergencies. So, and in terms of the news, they are in contact with the national weather service and in the emergency operations center, they've got this big wall of TVs and they're watching the news. They're watching the, from the national weather service, they're watching the forecasts. And so I think to that, you know, my table is just one 
thing for us specifically for Contra Costa to give us a real heads up, hey, warning, you know, all the lights are red or green or whatever, and the storm is coming, the forecasts say it, um, then that means our crews would be on call. There might be some guys that are doing overtime all, all night long just to be on call to make sure to clear a road or block a road that floods. So yeah, it's not like that table is the only voice that speaks. Uh, so I hope that answers that question. Okay, thank you. So uh, you made, the, I guess, John, you made the pitch about funding. So uh, that's something that maybe we, we can help with in a way of offering uh, our support if, the, if this group agrees. Uh, just need to know uh, where the request should be directed towards for our support. And so that's my proposal, Gary, is that uh, this task force offer to support uh, the additional funding requests or needs for a very innovative concept that has a lot of benefit um, beyond what we've even heard about today. Bob, let, let me just, I want to, um, first of all, thank you for that very kind um, offer of support there. I also, I wanted to make sure I jump back and answer your other question too, because you asked the one about the the weather broadcast and the local news. Um, it, it's actually a great point. I wrote a note down to myself. This program from the very beginning has been really focused around partners in, in water and wastewater management. And they've been sort of the major drivers and some of the major users of the data. And I think that'll continue. We, of course, we've had discussions about what other groups we should reach out to in the near future and what other communities and industries that obviously emergency management is one, transportation. And for a lot of these sort of industri industry or other sectors, we've been waiting, we've been holding off because we want to spin up the decision support tools to a more robust level where they can use them, that where it's actionable information. The weather broadcast, the, the weather forecaster, you know, on the on the news broadcast, I'm surprised this actually has never come up. And it's a it's a very interesting idea because they don't really need any add-ons. They just need the raw radar data. And it would be, you know, I think this is a this is something I need to consult with a few other, you know, trusted advisors and that sort of thing on. But it's a very novel idea to start thinking about whether we find a way to make that data available to them and, and offer some information or training about it. Yeah, so thank you. John, to add to what you and Bob just talked about, how is Weather Service using AQPI data now? And is there a plan for them to rely on it more? Because I'm thinking the app on my phone, that comes from Weather Service data, yeah. correct? Yes, the radar data, the radar is going to come almost assuredly from a weather service radar. Yeah. Right. So we've been working with the forecast office in Monterey uh, and increasingly so over the last few months. There's a couple of ways that we are sort of starting to test making the AQPI data available to them within their native, let's call it forecast system framework. They've The weather service has a thing. It's called AWIPS. It's another acronym. I won't talk about what it is. It's essentially software in which they edit the forecast and issue watches and warnings and advisories. And so the traditional radar data flows into that system. AQPI does not right now. We'd like to sort of eventually break that open and have the AQPI data flow into them. And so Monterey is sort of going to be our local test for doing this. And I think it's going to begin with just sending them a few files and seeing if they can load them into the system and work out the technical details from there. But this is definitely something that we're we're working on a, a greater integration there. Thanks, John. Um, one other question, isn't there applicability for other areas uh, down the coast of California? And Dale, you know, pipe in here. Um, for, for this kind of system, this short band radar that sees lower and sees atmospheric river storms versus shooting out over the top. Has there been discussion at DWR level about um, 
using these X-band and C-band radars in other areas of California. Uh, Dale, I know you've been involved in that sort of discussion, so I didn't know if you wanted to chime in on that question. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Um, we have been in discussions with the uh, Department of Water Resources, in particular, uh, Mike Anderson uh, basically calls this project a pilot. Uh, he sees this um, as a demonstration of what uh, such a uh, precipitation detection and forecasting system can do. Uh, it's a good place to start and we can build upon it. Um, and then he's mentioned um, deploying it elsewhere like LA or San Diego counties um, in particular, those areas that see the characteristics of atmospheric rivers coming in and, and the, the concentrated bands of atmospheric rivers that aren't really, you know, can, can hit anywhere, you know, even as Mark was saying, they can change in, in a few hours where they hit, you know, we think it's gonna hit Monterey, but it hits Santa Cruz or it hits San Francisco or something like that. At least that's in our area. Similar things happens up and down the coast. It's more populated down south, uh, but they, uh, up in like the Eureka area, uh, it, it can go all over the place. They get enough rain anyways, um, and, but plenty of flooding. But uh, yeah, I would say definitely there's, uh, uh, we're thinking of, uh, uh, replication uh, of the same type of system elsewhere. Uh, the immediate concern is get it working for the San Francisco Bay Area, though. Um, and I think as John talked about the different types of radars, that C-band, the one in the middle, that's sort of the middle ground that can see further off the coast, I think that's going to inform our precipitation monitoring and our precipitation forecasting uh, much better. So we're really excited about once that data gets into the system and we're able to leverage uh, the full uh, AQPI uh, radar deployment and uh, put it to put it to better better use with existing radars and new radars. And uh, I I think we're going to have an explosion of new information. So. Uh, uh, we, we're not going to, uh, we don't want to start replicating it yet until we uh, can prove the, the victories uh, we anticipate uh, achieving. Dale, you want to talk about Eero a little, just briefly, just the, the, the multi, yeah. multi-use aspects of this? Uh, yeah, so uh, Mark mentioned FIRO, which stands for, for another acronym. Uh, Noah's not alone in coming up with acronyms. The water world comes up with <laughs> OMG. They come up with a lot of them. So uh, <laughs> Forecast Informed Reservoir Operation is a program we started well, at least 10 years ago with uh, John Center, uh, with Marty Ralph, the head of the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. Um, and it is a system that uh, looks at, it's more of a uh, water supply uh, and flood control monitoring system, wherein we, instead of just following uh, age old tried and true, but pretty conservative rule curves for how much water to release from reservoirs that serve as water supply and as serve as flood protection um, infrastructure, uh, we look at the, um, look at the, the forecast and let the, more sophisticated and more developed uh, meteorological forecasts inform uh, the releases of the reser reservoirs, um, the water from the reservoirs. Um, it came about uh, when one time uh, one of our smaller lakes, Lakes Mendocino, uh, was at a level where uh, above the flood protection pool and they released a bunch of water, the Army Corps of Engineers did, uh, as there has been proven to be effective, but then we had a, a stream of dry weather and it was, uh, we didn't have much water for water supply later in the year. We said, well, what'd you release water for? And they said, well, um, <clears throat> uh, well, it was the water level was above the rule curve. That's what we always do. It said, but 
some smart Alex said, well, did you look outside? Because it was gloriously sunny. So that's kind of, that concept is where uh, Firo came from, is uh, let's, before you release the water, let's not just look at what historically has been done, what's been conservatively laid out, which works. Um, uh, if you're very conservative, nothing, nothing bad will happen, but nothing awesome will happen either, like saving, you know, 10 or 20 percent of the water supply uh, for the season or for the year, I should say. So um, whereas these radars are more for short term forecasting, we do see the, the benefit of them also informing uh, some of the long term uh, water supplies for water managers around the region, especially those who rely more on local water supply than say uh, snowpack or uh, state water project type water. So uh, Mark or John, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. I don't think I have much to, to elaborate on. I'll just say that if this group was ever interested in a, in a FIRO presentation, I'd be happy to facilitate setting that up with, with the program manager for that, that program at our center. I also just want to add very briefly you know, sort of related to your comments on the expandability of of the the denser radar network, Dale, that these radars can also see smoke. And you can imagine the benefits of that to many parts of the state. And it's not something we've like really looked into close closely or delved deeply into yet, hence why you didn't see any of that in the presentation today. But it's been documented that you can see smoke plumes with these expand radars. And then the uh the other leg of the stool, I don't know if you want how many legs we have yet, but um, is uh, sewer overflows. So mm -hmm. the East Bay dischargers are involved and they get fined by the Regional Water Quality Control Board when there's a lot of rain and their sewer systems get overwhelmed by water that seeps into the sewer pipes underground, or maybe there could be some surface water that gets in and then they their, their treatment systems just can't handle that volume. And so the AQPI, uh, forecast can help with uh, the sewer overflow issues. Um, you know, San Francisco has a combined storm and sewer system. They also are highly interested in this. So it's it's kind of multifaceted. We always think of rain and flooding, but rain and water supply, that's really key. And especially the FIRO, I think it's awesome. I don't have any reservoirs like that, but I just, just to think that that's great. And then the sewer overflow is something I Again, I'm not that involved in, but I've heard that it could be very beneficial understanding the timing. They can, you know, uh, get active and storing the water, the sewer stuff someplace else so that when the overflows um, possibly can come, that they're ready for it. They reduce pollution as well as their fines that come on their agency when they, they do have that problem. So just want to point that out. This system is not just, not just flooding. Dave, I'm I'm just intuiting that you might have a question. <laughs> no, I Mark beat me to it. I was just going to say that that really I do believe this has a very positive implications for for sewer systems. Sewer, in real time, you know, we really don't have many agencies that that are involved with real time control of their collection systems, uh, but this kind of data would would really inform that. And I think San Francisco PUC is a great place to start because they do actually operate their combined system during wet weather and manage where water is stored versus where it's treated. We're, we're absolutely in, in touch with them about how, ways they can use this, yeah. And they're, and they're locating a radar uh, in the uh, peninsula next, so, right? Every, uh, does anyone else have some questions here, I think? I, I'll just jump, jump in, Ann, and say that um, I've been watching the, the progress of this program for the last seven years and um and there the reason why it is the funding has lasted so long is because of individuals like mark and and others who have put so much time and effort into into making this work and getting the funding applications done and 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 uh so just appreciate that you've been able to bootstrap this thing for for so long and and so we would very much want to support that final step of funding sounds like annual funding as far as as opposed to capital funding, um, and so yeah, as a council, we'd love to support you.
John, do you have any comment on the funding requirements being annual or or capital? Is he? It, it, that, that's correct. That it is it is annual. I mean, the capital expenditures are primarily taken care of by that original grant in terms of getting the the system installed. It's really that ongoing operation and maintenance cost that, whether state or federal or wherever you look, it's it's harder to find support than that. Innovation and capital is relatively easy. Operation and maintenance is hard. Dale, I just had a question for you. You know, uh, your radar is the first one in the system. And um, so you've probably been getting data longer than any agency in the AQPI Bay Area system. Do you have any examples from Sonoma's standpoint? I, you, Fero is obviously a big one. But um, in your local area during these storms that we've had over the last, you know, five, seven years. Um, I would say we're not as uh, sophisticated as Mark Boucher is <laughs> <laughs> and as uh, Emily down at uh, Valley Water. Um, uh, we're trying, we, I mean, we have some good images of some local uh, watersheds um, that have seen uh, uh, and we can identify the the locations and timing of uh, heavy precipitation and how that translated to resultant uh, stream flows and flooding um, uh, during the atmospheric rivers. But as far as uh, making it more actionable, uh, I'm going to have to confess uh, we're, we're we we haven't uh, deployed it uh, as well as we would like to yet. Um, John's John Rutz is uh, on an AQPI tour this summer. Uh, you can get tickets on Ticketmaster. Um, <laughs> coming by uh, some of the areas, and we hope to have our Department of Emergency Management and some of the other cities uh, in the area uh, learn more about it and uh, get them up to speed on on what can be done and and what others are doing uh, with some of the data because uh, we're we're lacking in that regard. Uh, just full confession. Oh, that's a great deal. Thank you. And we, we did have the first one, but that, that first radar we deployed was Colorado State uh, going to their, um, their junkyard and piecing together a bunch of radar parts and they deployed one early, but they've since replaced that with a, a real DWR funded radar uh, <laughs> that's uh, exactly like all the others being deployed around. So. We we're basically on our second radar, <laughs> but, um, and uh, as Ann said, we hope to have one in the West Bay pretty soon. So we'll have each of the ordinance covered by X-band radar and then a C-band in uh, Marin, uh, uh, hopefully next year um, with, uh, that can track the atmospheric rivers <laughs> further off the coast and that we'll, we can be ahead of the game and in, inform decision makers at that time. Yeah, in terms of things like, you know, very flattered, everybody thinks I'm so far ahead of the curve, but there's some people in Santa Clara Valley that have been doing stuff and and uh, San Francisco that have been doing some pretty intense stuff. But I think that we have a users group and we, we do meet quarterly. And I believe that as things progress, for example, uh, Marin, they've been asking, I get all the data in one file. And I'm just dealing with five points, but the guy in Marin, uh, he's been asking for separate files. And I know John's like, got, you know, they're got a waiting for a time, but, you know, with a little bit of a Python programming, you could take the data and split it into files. So, um, and I've been doing the download and, and I developed the Python program that would, does most of what I want to do before I bring to Excel. So just the, so the point is Dale and everybody that, this users group, you know, once I get the software running, all the data is in the same format. There's no reason I couldn't say, you know, if you just add this routine to this Python program, it'll split it out before to whatever files you want. So it could be that what I'm doing and, and as uh, Roger Leventhal and Marin gets his stuff going, and we start sharing some code and because we're dealing with the same, there's no reason we couldn't, in a sense, make a library. So here, Dale, here's... All you have to do is change the path where you get the data and where you want to put it on your server. And behold, now you're you're ahead of the game because of 
you've leveraged my experience. And so that's, I think that's the, the key to working as a bunch of users that, you know, I'm, I have no problem sharing my data. Santa, San Francisco has offered to share their stuff too. So I think that's, that's another strength we have all working together. I'll just comment quickly, Mark, that part of the, the rebuild of the user interface is to do some of that legwork for you guys. It's certainly if there's stuff that exists, it can be a repository for that, but to improve the formatting and, and data dissemination. Well, I'll just I'll just say thank you very much to East Bay Leadership Council before we go into your announcements. Um, and thanks to our speakers. Um, I've been honored to be a part of the project working with Bay Planning Coalition on um, marketing, outreach, government affairs to a certain point. And uh, it's just great to see it coming together. And we appreciate East Bay Leadership Council's support moving forward. Thank you, guys. Meg, on to you. I think that's it on my end, um, unless there's any other announcements. Thank you again to our speakers and to Anne for putting this all together. Um, this was a really engaging talk. So thanks, everyone.